My attention has been drawn to the book of Luke, and I want to look at that tonight. Um, we've shared several things in John. As I said before, we, uh, we're going to start on the foundation series that we did about five years ago. We're going to do that again uh, starting in July. Uh, the reason for that is because we're going to be going the first week of June uh, to Ohio. And I don't want to start it in the middle of being gone. Then we're going to be going for a youth camp at the end of June. So I just feel like it's a clear slate that we can kind of keep things the momentum rolling. It runs about 12 weeks. Um, actually, the six-week mark will be where Kids Crusade is. So it'll break right in the middle for that one Tuesday evening. There are some other things that I'm looking at as we look at that Tuesday evening, a little bit of adjustment. I'm going to talk to the council um, and uh, get some thoughts on some things. Uh, but we want, we want to, uh, you know, do the videos. We'll give the workbooks out. Let's invite folks. Um, even for this, even if folks go to other churches, our Tuesday night is off for most folks. Invite them out. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can just get a good group of people mm -hmm. that will come, that will understand the foundations of uh, creation. And uh, I think it will be beneficial to all of us. I look forward to it myself because it's good for us to review. The Word of God um, you know, it, it is, is much review, even when you look at the Old Testament and New Testament. And I like what Brother Justin was talking about. Uh, on Sunday morning in Sunday school, we're looking at Catholicism and looking at, um, yeah, my mind's going blank, brother, right there in the middle, between the Old Testament and New Testament, what do they call it? The Apocrypha books. Um, why don't we accept that? Actually, I've been asked that question a lot um, by folks, and uh, it's good for us to know because the consistency of those books do not line up with the, the New Testament. In a lot of the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll find that the Old Testament books, foundation is given in the New Testament. And uh, there's a lot of folks who struggle with that, ask questions. A lot of folks that were raised Catholic that wonder why. So it's good for us to have answers as to why. All right, so tonight, uh, Luke chapter number 10 then let's start at verse number 25. Would someone be so kind as just to read verse number 25 through verse number 37? And uh, we'll see what we can gain from the Lord of God this evening. We hold a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, saying, He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with thy own soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by the other side. But he served Samaritan as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had a compassion on him, and went to him, and bound him of his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own feet, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the morrow, when he departed, he took, uh, took out two pence and gave them to him, the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was his neighbor unto him? That thou Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do what thou like. All right. So, very familiar story. Good challenge for all of us. Let's understand it to the fullest that we can tonight. I'll give you opportunity to share as always at the end. Um, but uh, 
and even if you want to say something, though, you can pop your hand up. Uh, give us food for thought. Let us know what you're thinking. But uh, the Bible says that Jesus was talking to a certain lawyer. All right, so tell me about this lawyer. Who is he? What do you know about this lawyer? What, who do you think he is? Okay. Well, he could be. <laughs> but when we say lawyer in, in a broad sense, what do you think that he knew much, 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 most about? The law. The law. What, what law, actually? The law. Or the Mosaic law, right? There's no right or wrong. It's all right, Kyle. I'm just asking questions. The Mosaic Law, which when we think of the Mosaic Law, what do we think about? What is the Mosaic Law? It's stuff. Ten Commandments. So, you know, we're looking at the Pentateuch. We're looking at uh, the, the law. And so here is this lawyer, and he is supposed to know the Mosaic Law, the law that is given by God. He should know it well. And uh, when we look at him, not only is he a lawyer, but we would probably uh, title him this in our day and age because they kind of rode uh, and uh, straddled the fence of being bivocational, so to speak. He was a lawyer, but he was also a theologian. He should have knew the things of God because the law was what God had said. So uh, he's a lawyer, he's a theologian, and, and the Bible says that he did tempt him, or he tempted Jesus. What was he tempting Jesus about? What do you think he was doing? Interesting. What do you know about the law? How do I get there? Because he's asking, how do I get to heaven? Uh, I, I want you to tell me what you know about the law. Now, what uh, this so-called expert ev evidently didn't really know much, uh, but what he was asking, he was asking the one who knew all about the law, but was the law, because he is the Lord of God. So I, here, here he's asking, and, and, and Jesus knows everything about the law. And uh, he tempts Jesus. He's trying to st uh, stop him, as Brother Justin said, with asking the question, what must I do to have eternal life? The lawyer, he knew all the right doctrine. But listen to me. He knew all the right doctrine, but he had a wrong spirit. Isn't that interesting? You ever meet any Christians that way? They can have it all right, and they can know all about it, but their spirit can be wrong. So it takes that joining of knowing what's right, but also having the right spirit. And Jesus is going to deal with the root of this problem of, of, of having the right spirit. And so uh, what does the law tell you? Well, that I'm to love the Lord thy God with all my heart and uh, with all my soul and with all my strength and with all my might. And I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. Rightfully speaking. He's quoting actually from Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. That is what the law says. That you're going to love the Lord thy God with all the heart, with all the mind, with all the soul, with all the strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. That is what you must do to, 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 to inherit eternal life. And so Jesus, he's so smart, isn't he? Don't you like how God just begins to put it out there? And uh, he gives a parable. He gives a story that, that is uh, somewhat, if you want to say, fictional. He, he tells a story that is not necessarily the case, but it, it, it is very true. And then the stor story that he gives has a moral. Now, it's, it's, it's greater than me just simply saying that because it's a story and it has a moral, but it is a heavenly story. God has a heavenly principle that He wants man to apply on earth with that story. And so He said that this, He said that a certain man went down. Now it's interesting as we look at this because uh, where they were, you would do two things. You would go up to go to Jerusalem, but you would go down if you were going to Jericho. Now, in this day and age, they considered a couple of things, Brother Eli. 
Uh, Jerusalem is a place of blessing. However, Brother Justin, Jericho is a place of curse. Uh, when we look uh, at the Word of God, uh, when we look at uh, Joshua uh, 6.26, it gives validation to that place of Jericho being a place known as a curse. And so this, uh, the, 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 the traveler symbolizes someone who's really walking away from blessing and walking to curse. So it can symbolize this someone who's really walking away from God, whether intentionally or whether unintentionally walking away from God. And it can also be that of looking at uh, how did, remember that guy that got swallowed by a big fish, what was his name? Jonah. Where did he go? He went down. He went down. He didn't know where, where God wanted him to, but he went in the opposite direction. He went down. And so he was running away from God. And so it's symbolic of saying that here's someone walking away from the blessing of God. And when, when they can choose to go up to the blessing of God, they're walking down. So the certain man went down. And the Bible says that he fell among thieves. Now there's two takes on this. You can choose whichever one you want. Now, I'm not going to lose out with you. It's very interesting to think about how that, that, that folks look at this. But, 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 uh, let me find myself. That he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. Now, some folks would say he began to keep bad company. And when he kept bad company, uh, what happens? It corrupts good manners, doesn't it? That's what the Word of God says. Evil communication corrupts good manners. So he is a good God, Brother Justin. He's trying to do what's right, but he, 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 he aligns himself with those that are not good. And so they turn on him. They beat him up. They take advantage of him, Brother Doug. Or the second case, which I think our mind just naturally gravitates to, Sister Tina, is that he was just traveling and someone come and took advantage of him, beat him up. And uh, here it is, whether it's willfully or whether uh, uh, that, that he just fell prey to temptation or whether he chose temptation, uh, what eventually ended up was that a robber robbed him. Let me say this. Anytime that we are put at the place the enemy comes in, we will wind up robbed. The enemy is, is a robber. And so the Bible says that the, the enemy stripped him of his raiment. He, he stripped him of what he had. So his clothing, maybe his belt, maybe he had on some fancy shoes, maybe he had on what's some name brand stuff that's all, you know, someone would want. You know, take that stuff. Maybe they want to take it and on the black market sell it, make money, however that may be. But the enemy robbed him. Took him of his raiment. Listen to what Isaiah 61 verse 10 says. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. A bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. So here it is that God anoints us and decks us when He saves us, but the enemy like to rob us of the treasure of, of, of how that God has dressed us. The Bible says that God gives us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. But the enemy doesn't like the garment of praise. He wants to rob it from us. And so here is this, 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 this one who fell prey to the enemy. He's being robbed. The Bible says, and wounded now. Tonight, the enemy wants to wound you. He wants to wound you. All right, I'm going to wait for the lanky lady to get out. She's fine, but she's draining me of every thought in my head. If it's someone else's child, it's all good. All right. Yeah, it's funny when, when, when it happens to you personally. 
So here it is, those great wounds of violence, immorality, addictions. Isn't that what the enemy does to people? Wounds of immorality. You know, and some people may, may put a size on immorality or put a size on sin. But do you know how many people, and their sin may not be magnified in great bit, but they live in a prison because of the things that happened in their yesterdays. The enemy does that. He wants. We know the Word of God says, Brother Justin, when you look up Isaiah 1 6, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but, to, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have a life and they might have it more abundantly. Brother Justin, when you find Isaiah 1 6, would you read that? For my soul is put even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Wow. Let's talk about this spiritually. There's wounds, there's bruises. Putrefying, the word of God says. They're oozing, they're pussing, they're infected because they've not been placed with ointment and bound up. There's, there is. The one who went down, gashing wounds, whatever it is, symbolic, really this is symbolic of anybody who's not saved. Wounds that are putrefying. Bruises. They're deep. I, I recently met someone at a bruise because of uh, getting hit by a piece of ice. A friend of mine I ran into, they recognized me, I didn't even recognize them. His grandmother used to sew things for this vertically challenged fellow that needs everything shortened up. And so he was sharing with me that he was out duck hunting and he got hit by a piece of ice. Didn't realize it, but his leg was just bruised because of blood supply. It took all the blood supply away from his leg, wound up losing his leg because of that. It wasn't that it was a gash, it wasn't that it was a wound, it was because it was bruised. My heart was just broken as I heard his story. So here it is. I mean, just terrible things that the enemy does. And the Bible says that, that, uh, that the enemy, the robber, left him for half dead. He was just barely hanging on. Didn't expect him to live. Didn't expect him to survive. Throw him at the side of the road. He's not going to make it. He's half dead. No one will see him. Maybe no one will probably even hear him moaning. He's half dead. Can I tell you tonight that that's the way the world and everyone in the world is? That when they've not experienced the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their life, biblically speaking, they are only living uh, uh, physically and emotionally. Spiritually, they're dead. And so everything that they do, they are driven by their emotions. They're driven by their will. They're driven by lust and by passion. Uh, they've not been uh, uh, given uh, a life in their soul where the Spirit of God convicts them and leads them. That's why our decisions are different. We don't live by our passions. We don't live by our lust. Uh, but, but we live in accordance to, to what God has for us. Listen to what the Word of God says in Ephesians uh, 2, verse 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That was us. We were once a living life, half dead. We weren't alive. The Bible says, wherein in times past you walked according to, uh, to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, uh, among whom also we had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, uh, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. That was you and I. We were like this guy that was living half dead. Just living by the passions of our life. 
The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. I don't want to live dead. There was a man, Sister Stacy, beaten, wounded, left for half dead. And the Bible says that there came a certain priest. Now, priests represented this. They represented the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, the, the, uh, but, but, but the Bible says that Brother Eli, this priest walked by, didn't even look upon him, had no mercy on the man Brother Doug. No mercy. So Brother Justin, the law in itself, the Bible says he that despised the law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. James says, for whosoever shall keep the law and yet offend in one point is guilty of it all. The law couldn't do anything. Listen, if we had to depend on the law to get to heaven, to give us life, to revive us, to help us, there was no way it could do it. Because even though we kept every everything, but we broke one thing, we were guilty of breaking it all. The Bible says, and likewise, a Levite. The Levite, he represents the ceremonial law of God, all the sacrifices, uh, everything that, that, that could, be, could, could be done to cover sin. But yet, Brother Eli, the Levite could only cover sin, but Justin couldn't get rid of sin. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. But thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Huh. The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So, the priest couldn't help. The Levite couldn't help. The Bible says that then there came a Samaritan. Now, you know what? Jesus was dealing with something much deeper, Sister Tina, because these were Mongols. These were despised people. The Jews did not like the Samaritans. So, why, Brother Doug? Here is this theologian, this lawyer, who's getting a taste of what he said. But the Samaritan, the good Samaritan. Here he is. Uh, even what religious leaders they couldn't do, but the good Samaritan. And I believe this tonight. I know that we need to be good Samaritans. But I truly believe that when we look at this parable, that the good Samaritan is Jesus Christ. He's a good Samaritan. He's the one that looks past who we are and where we've been. He looks past our going down. He looks past our living life half dead. He looks past our wounds and our bruises that are putrefied. He's the one who looks past who we are and where we've been. And he says, I will help. And the Bible says that this good Samaritan... He had compassion on him. The Levite, when he, uh, when he was at the place, came and looked on and passed by. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came by. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. How many times do we look at the Word of God, we look at the Gospels, and we see that Jesus was moved with him? It was moved with compassion for this man. And the Bible says that he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Let me say, I believe that the oil represents the Holy Ghost. I believe the blood represents, or the wine represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Only he can get in those wounds and cleanse them. You know, one of the greatest things in our life that we can ever learn to do for ourselves is learn to forgive. By nature, we're going to hold on to it, don't we? I'm going to 
forgive them. They did me wrong. They deserve me being mad at them. Why should I just give them a free pass? Well, in ourself, we can't do it. But Jesus Christ requires that of us. When He puts in the blood. And then He begins to cleanse with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I love what Isaiah 61 1 says. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Amen. Thank God that He takes care of us. Our wounds can be physical, amen, but our wounds can be emotional, more so emotional and spiritual, amen. God comes by and He helps us, amen. He gets in those wounds and He changes us, amen. He cleanses us. Those things that are, uh, can just cause a stink. I've seen some wounds before, folks, and let me tell you what, it can stink, there's some times I've had to take care of people that I've had to put a mitt in my mouth and breathe through my mouth so my nose did not have to smell what was happening in their wound. Because it smells bad. It's oozing, it's pussing, it's terrible. That's what sin does. That's what sin does. Things of a lustful passion and nature and Things where we don't offer forgiveness, but we allow hurt and resentment and bitterness to build up and it stinks and it smells terrible. Only God can get in there and clean that out. It leaves us not living a life and we're half dead. The Bible says that Jesus took him and he put him on his own beast. He's getting ready to bring him to the end. But the good Samaritan, he said, listen, I'll let you ride on my beast of burden. Aren't you glad that we can take our burdens to the Lord and leave them there? Praise God, you don't have to bear your burden on your own, but I will. I know we hear the beginning of this, but listen to this. Galatians chapter number 2, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The Word of God goes on to say that we do not frustrate the grace of God. Amen. We could frustrate righteousness which came through the law, but we do not frustrate the grace of God. He does not, he does not care to take our burdens and bear them for us. And the Bible says that he brought him to the end. Everyone who Jesus brings out of the world, he brings them to the church. Amen. We are the end. We're the place where God brings those who've been broken and wounded and left for dead. Amen. He brings them to the end. And he says, here, I, I, I want you to take care of this one who Satan has wounded and left for dead. The enemy, he's out to kill. You talk about living in a day and age. I, I, I someone shared with me today that uh, someone just a couple of years younger than me overdosed and killed themselves over the weekend. The enemy's a lot. Can you imagine the turmoil that's going on in the mind prior to taking your own life? 
The enemy's a liar. There was some wounds. There was some bruises. There was some festering. There was some putrefying. Amen. The enemy was a lie. You know what? God didn't intend for that to be. God wanted to take that person and pick them up and put that person on his beast of burden. Amen. And the, the, the world, they're left wounded. They're left half dead. God help us that the good Samaritan can get to them through us and, and the gospel can be given and their wounds can be cleansed and it can be mollified by the Spirit of God and by 